good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hatfield Congregational Church. Uh, summer vacation is kicked in at school, so I guess it's summer vacation in the church as well. I don't have all of my friends up here anymore. I'm all by myself. Even the organist is way down there. I'm all by my lonesome. Um, but today, I do want to mention that flowers here in the sanctuary, this beautiful arrangement right here, is offered by Marsha Sheehan. Uh, it's not here today, though. Uh, and it is offered in honor of her husband, Jean Sheehan, and her friend, Sue Gilman, uh, both who are fighting cancer. So the beauty of that, uh, we're going to hope is going to translate into the beauty of their prognosis, and everything is going to work out well for the both of them. If anyone would like to offer a floral arrangement such as this to be placed in our sanctuary to sign up for one of our Sunday morning chat and coffees or to let us know about a favorite Sunday hymn, those sign-up sheets are right over there. If anyone would like to purchase gift cards for a stop and shop for Big Y, Linda is right there. Uh, the hunger does not take a summer off. Um, maybe these are still in your bulletins. Uh, we have a great collection already up here. Uh, there may be some more stuff coming in later with the wagon when we do the children's sermon, uh, but all of this will be going to uh, Northampton, to the Hampshire County Survival Center, so thank you very much for, uh, for your donations. If you uh, didn't have a chance to go and get some non-Christian food items and you'd still like to make a donation, uh, we do take checks, we take cash, anything like that, and so you can uh, give that to us as well today, all to benefit the uh, Survival Center. Also, our United Church of Christ denomination was formed on June 25th, which is tomorrow, 1957. So um, as of tomorrow, we are 61 years old. So that's our birthday. Tomorrow is the United Church of Christ. The Bible study group will also meet tomorrow evening from 7 until 8 p.m. And um, I'm finding it really exciting because there are conversations that are taking me to, uh, to ideas and thoughts that I, you know, and I, I try to read the Bible every day, but people at that, kind of, at that table are taking me to places that I hadn't expected to go. And so I'm, uh, I invite any of you. Um, there's Red Sox on for sure, but the rest of television is just a desert right now. Uh, so if you want to come, you know, join us for just an hour over here in the parlor. It's relatively cool. The discussions are informal. You don't have to know a lot about the Bible. Just kind of have a, a knowledge of, of what it is and, and why you want to learn about it. And so I would invite any and all to come tomorrow evening to our Bible study from 7 until 8. Also, beginning next Sunday, our services for the summer will begin at 9.30 because it is so much cooler a half hour earlier than now. Uh, so next Sunday is 9.30, and that's all through July and all through August as well. Are there any other announcements from the congregation? Ooh, summertime doldrums. No announcements at all. Okay, if there are no announcements, then the prelude for this morning's worship, and I should probably mention as well, I want to make sure I got the name correct. Hold on one sec. First Congregational Church today welcomes our baritone soloist, Stephen Berlanga. And Stephen is a, a formal choral director of the Williston Northampton School, and he will continue his doctoral work in Indiana next fall. And so when he does sing in his uh, German from the Bach, uh, if you want the translation, that is on the back of your bulletin today. And uh, I heard uh, Stephen here uh, practicing before service this morning. I came in and I asked Anthony if he and I could do a duet. And Anthony, <laughs> Anthony very kindly says, this is the before, that's the after. <laughs> so, no duets. So the prelude for this morning's service is Silent Noon from Ralph Vaughn Williams.
when Stephen becomes internationally famous, you remember, you heard him right here at the Ashfield Congregation. So today is Open and Affirming Sunday throughout the United Church of Christ. And in that uh, spirit, welcome to the First Congregational Church of Hatfield, an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ as voted upon by the members of this congregation. We welcome members, friends, family, guests, and seekers. We welcome believers solid in their faith, and we welcome those who are still searching. Whoever you are, whoever you are, and wherever you are in life's journey, I'm so happy to say you are welcome here. So today um, we gather, and uh, a little bit later on this morning, Sharon and I are zooming out to Boston, so uh, your wish may come true. I may have a shorter sermon. We'll see what the Spirit says. Uh, but last week we were supposed to get together with my, uh, my two daughters, but one of them uh, was flying back from Europe. And so today is uh, my belated Father's Day. So we're heading out after service to Boston. So moving right along, if you would now join the call to worship. <coughs> Let us gather in awe before Christ our Lord. Open our hearts to the steadfast love that he offers to everyone. The deeds of God are beyond our comprehension, but in Jesus we see the divine mercy and the care of life. Jesus will not forsake us when we are confused or belittled, and neither will his church. He is with us always. Christ is the stronghold of the Christ. Jesus is ready to listen to us in those moments together. See, now is the acceptable time, now is the acceptable place to meet with God. Surely God is here in our midst. How good it is when we sense our identity in Christ. Praise be to God. Amen. Let us now come together in our unison prayer. Wonderful Creator, constant friend, all people, regardless of the labels we force upon them, have the right to live with dignity and without persecution or discrimination. This day, we celebrate your all-inclusive love, and we pray for those people who are threatened and harmed because of the way they love. We pray for those who are targets of hate crimes and assaults, and those who are discriminated against in your holy name. Let us stand up for their dignity, and let us recognize your presence in them. Today, we rededicate ourselves to building bridges of love and hope, making the equality of all people our goal, so that everyone can live fully in your love. Amen. Let us now join together as we sing from Blue Hymnal number 69, How Like a Gentle Spirit.
to come together and share with each other the gift of peace.
That's cathedral. We can spend all kinds of money on buildings. We can spend all kinds of time making this prettier. But the thing that God counts as his cathedral is right here. That ability to care for one another, that ability to come together, that ability to raise our hands together to God, that's cathedral. And so when we're thinking about church, buildings are important, but the most important idea of church is us and them and that guy up there in that beautiful window. All right? As long as we got him and us, we could do this out in the field. We could do this anywhere we wanted. It could be raining outside and Jesus would show up. It could be 100 degrees outside and Jesus would show up. Okay? It's not about the building. It's about this. When we come together, and that's the message of today, this open and affirming, when we come together and start accepting each other, that's cathedral. Okay? So just remember this little image about those two hands come together. When we come together and try to... Let's do it again, Troy. When we come together... <laughs> and make that little prayer hand, that's church. Amen. All right, you guys, you guys have a good Sunday school or, no, nope, yes, Sunday school or, yes, or they can go back, whatever you guys want to do, it's up to you. All right.
our joys, our celebrations, and our concerns. Um, the first celebration I'd like to mention is someone shared with me um, over the, the internet the other day. Um, I think it's called the Late Late Show, and I don't even know who the I don't stand for the Late Late Show, so I can't remember the, the guy who's the host. Uh, but he was driving around in Liverpool with Sir Paul McCartney uh, from the Beatles. And as he was doing so, you know, they were singing Beatles songs together in the car. And I think it was Let It Be and the host. Does anybody know who the host is of the Late Late Show? James Corden. That? What? James Corden? James Corden. James yeah. Corden? Yeah. yeah. So he's driving around and he starts to cry. And Paul McCartney just says that music has that ability uh, to touch people in special ways. And then they went into this little pub and these people weren't expecting Paul McCartney. And as they went up to the jukebox, um, they could hit the selections, which were all Beatles tunes. And they were expecting it to come out of the jukebox. The, uh, the screens open and there's Paul McCartney singing these Beatles tunes. And then the, the song would end, the curtain would close, somebody else would pick another one, the curtain would open. And I mean, these people, they were so happy. And they, you know, there were blacks and whites. Um, there, I'm sure there were immigrants and natives. Uh, people from Liverpool, and they all came together over a little pint of beer and music. And that's a celebration I'd like to mention. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for bringing this. Um, when I play the piano at home, I got these like fat notes that are on the sheet. You should see all the black on the music these guys are singing. Um, it, it's a gift, and it's a celebration. I want to say, I want to acknowledge that today. Also, a celebration prayer. Tomorrow is the 61st anniversary of the United Church of Christ, as I mentioned. In a world filled with increasing division and separation, I would like to offer up a celebration prayer for the four denominations that laid aside their differences and chose to become the United Church of Christ. And another celebration prayer I'd like to offer. I celebrate that this congregation has voted to be an open and affirming congregation. Jesus was demonstrably willing to break down barriers in order to embrace those who were once called sinners and were thought of as shunned by God. Ours, though, is a savior of extravagant welcome, and we can say, so is Hatfield Congregational Church, and I celebrate that. I offer a prayer of concern for the tone and example our nation seems to be accepting as our new normal. I ask Christ to teach us again about the practicality of generosity and compassion. May we aid those who are struggling, struggling desperately, and may we stand up for the weakest, whomever they may be, and wherever they may be from. Also, prayers for two dear ladies who are struggling at this time with cancer and its treatments. Also, prayers for Jean Sheehan, uh, who is undergoing his own cancer treatments. Uh, also, prayers for Sue Gilman, who has begun medical treatments for her cancer as well. Any other joys, celebrations, or concerns you'd like to share? Well, I'd like to um, celebrate the fact that our church is so generous in providing um, food for the Survival Center on our campaign for um, hunger does not take the same loss. Thank you very much for Brent mentioning. That is, that's going to that's gonna be up on Facebook later today. Uh, that's a beautiful picture, so thank you very much for all the donations. Okay. So let us also take an opportunity of just a few moments in the, the middle of our public worship, uh, just to give Jesus in the privacy of our own thoughts, of our own cathedral, uh, let Jesus speak to us and us speak to him. Christ has lifted us up from the dreariness of judgment to the hopefulness of compassion and empathy. Jesus walks with us through the difficult days of hardness of heart to show us a different path, a path less tried, but a path made clear by his light and his example. This is where we encounter our Savior, and it is to his ear that we have now offered our prayers and the assurance that from the weakest to the mightiest, Jesus is always ready to listen and to speak for us. Let us pray, but also let us be attentive to Jesus' words in reply. So please join me now in reciting together the prayer that Jesus himself taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We praise God with what we choose to give back to him through his church. We give so that others, even in greater need, may not be forgotten. We are thankful to Christ for the gift of a caring church that proclaims the good news to everyone and anyone who chooses to hear, and by gifts and actions such as this. We give so that everyone and anyone may be, who is maybe confronted by this astounding proposition that truly God is love. When so much in Christ's name is about those who are not right with God, let us instead be generous so that we can proclaim and preach a God of unbounded compassion.
Today's scripture is from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. If you'd like to follow along, it's on page 940 of your Pew Bible. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, At an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacles in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonment, riots, labors, sleepless nights, and hunger. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. And our Gospel reading today is taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. On that day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took Jesus with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat onto the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Jesus woke up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. And he said to them, Why were you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe, and they said to one another, Who in the world is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock, our Redeemer. Last weekend, the Tri-Conference Annual Meeting was held in Springfield, and Amy and I were there, and it took place at the Mass Mutual Center. And the delegates represented, as I quickly mentioned to the children, about 126 some odd thousand members of the United Church, Church of Christ in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Now that kind of number, just over 126,000, that will draw attention, especially when you combine that number with the proclamation that we are an open and affirming denomination. I'm going to talk about open and affirming in context just a little bit later, but for now, what is so provocative and disconcerting to some other Christians is that the UCC proudly embraces those who choose to love, just they love others in an untraditional way. For example, Outside of the Mass Mutual Center last Saturday were five African-American men. They had a microphone, they had a speaker, and they were preaching at the UCC, and they were condemning us and our open and affirming practices. Now, I had to go outside at lunchtime to get out of the air conditioning for a while, 
I hate hot, but too much air conditioning, I'm not a big fan of that either. So I had to go outside, get a little fresh air. And I walked over and through the little park where these guys were stationed with their speaker and their microphone. And I couldn't help but think to myself as I was walking by them, how strange it was for these particular men, these five African-American men, to be spouting biblical literalism because biblical literalism is going to present them with a real serious problem if they, if they dare to think it through. And you see, the UCC believes that God is still speaking. That's these commas here on the stole that I chose to wear today. So we believe that God is still speaking. And this means that we believe that the biblical word must be interpreted constantly. Each and every generation, each and every time we encounter the word, God is still speaking, which is the opposite of biblical literalism. We're here today on a Sunday to worship God. And this is a real easy example of why we're not biblical literalists. We're here on a Sunday, but Jesus celebrated the Sabbath on Saturday. Jesus was Jewish. The commandment says, Thou shalt keep holy the Sabbath day, which was the seventh day of the week, which is Saturday. Who changed keep holy the Sabbath day? Nobody changed the commandment, but we reinterpreted it after Sunday is the day that Jesus arose from the grave. We said, we're going to celebrate the Sabbath when Jesus arose and gave us new life. Number two, I'm up here on the wrong day of the week celebrating the Sabbath, and I've got polyester. That is hot as all get out, by the way. And I'm wearing a polyester vest. Leviticus 19.19 says... You shall not wear any vestment that takes more than one kind of material and combines them. I'm wearing polyester. I don't have just one or two, but I got poly vestments on. So God is up there saying you're here on the wrong day and you're insulting me the way that you're dressed. Two strikes already if we're biblical literalists. Then I just learned at the annual meeting that as a male minister, I'm in the minority. There are more female ministers in UCC than there are male. I left the church because I couldn't even get them to start talking about the possibility of women being ministers, or, or well, in that context, priests. I am now the minority in this church as a male. There are more women that feel called to come forward than there are men here. But a biblical literalist would turn to the New Testament where it says, Sharon, you listening? <laughs> Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. <laughs> well, we sure, as heaven, are not going to follow that New Testament rule because I'd be fearful for my life. Also, we just had a woman here, Marty. I'm a little bit scared of Marty. I'm not going to tell Marty she can't come up here and that she just messed up because she read the, the epistle wrong because she's a woman and God says, be silent. Strike three. The wrong day. The wrong look. The wrong person. We're messing up big time if we're biblical literalists. But now, back to those five African-American gentlemen preaching damnation at us because we are open and affirming. The Bible, the Old and the New Testaments, they allow for slavery. They encourage slavery. There is no problem with slavery. Unless those five African-American men were real recent immigrants to the United States of America, I guarantee they've got slave in their DNA. And if they are as literal as they claim they want to be, then instead of out there just talking about us being open and affirming, they should have been out there proclaiming the benefits of slavery. There's a whole New Testament epistle called Philemon that is written to a slave owner. And not once does Paul ever challenge the fact of slavery and says, Philemon, you're doing something wrong. You shouldn't own other human beings. Paul takes it as a given because 2,000 years ago, it wasn't that big a deal. It wasn't a social issue. It was something accepted. He works within the institution of slavery because that was part of the institution of a society. Our own attorney general just quoted the Bible when he said that government authority is from God, and then he quoted those who resist will incur judgment. Slavery was the law, the law of our land, and even some old congregational ministers owned other people because they didn't think it broke God's command. 
If you're going to be a literal reader of the Bible when it comes to open and affirming, well, then if you're going to be honest with yourself, you better be a literal reader when it comes to everything else, too. So slavery to those five African-American gentlemen yelling at me, you should be out there protecting slavery. And as Jeff Sessions says, it'd be immoral to ever challenge that law. Would those five guys preaching at us last Sunday agree? How could they? But how could they not if they really accept biblical literalism? Or we can take the wiser course. God gave us a gift up here called a brain. And God still, this is the image of God, is up here. It's not whether you are black or red or white or anything else. It doesn't matter if you're tall or short, if you've got red hair or brown hair. God doesn't look at the outside. Remember last week we talked God looks through the eyes and the soul. God sees us inside, and that's up here. This is where we are. This is where we're like God. We can think, we can choose, we can make decisions for ourselves. God gave us that. Nobody else out there. That plant can't decide to go anywhere else. You know, my dog is smart, smart as all get out, but he's still basically instinct. He does, he does things because you give him a treat for food. He doesn't think. We think. That's why we're like God. And so God gave us this, and he says, use that up there. And so that Bible is the revealed word of God, and that word is as alive as is Christ. It's not just locked in some pages from 2,000 years ago or even 3,000 years ago in the Old Testament. It still speaks to us today. God's revelation is as radical an alternative to the way that we choose to live. It pulls and pushes us towards trying to see as God sees. And when God looks down, he doesn't see us all that different. When you look at us, we're basically the same. And when God looks down on us, he doesn't see the different he says, I love you all. And that morally dangerous, it's not as morally dangerous to love even differently as it is instead to follow into a low, you know, that low, that, that slide down into the lowest kind of human behavior, which is a slide from anger and judgment into violence. And it's even worse when we do that violence and anger in the name of God. When we take the word as a package, instead of picking and choosing what we will follow and then what we will ignore, we hear consistently throughout the entire Bible a message of increasing, extravagant welcome. Now, God works in strange ways. I don't like popular music. I don't listen to popular music. But I was reading about a show out in Boston called The Jagged Little Pill. I have no idea what it's all about. But it's based on an album by somebody named Alanis Morissette. Anybody ever hear of Alanis Morissette? <laughs> oh, you're a lot cooler than I am. All right. So am I saying the name right? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, all right, there. So Alanis Morissette, and like I said, I have no idea who she is, but audiences are standing up in the middle of the show, right in the middle of an act, at the conclusion of a song that I guess she wrote called You Ought to Know. And the actors have to just stand there in character and wait for the audience to die down. So like I said, I don't know who Alanis Morissette is. I have no idea what Jagged Little Pill is. I have no idea of what You Oughta Know is. So I went to YouTube and I listened to You Oughta Know. Unimpressed. I don't know what they were all standing for. <laughs> but anyway, with Alanis Morissette, the next thing down on YouTube was a, a song called What If God Was One Of Us. Alanis Morissette singing What If God Was One Of Us. Any of you hear that? Yeah, more people have heard that? All right, all right, so I have no idea what um, you ought to know is, but what if God was one of us was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And it begins with the all too easily accepted idea of God just sitting up there in peace and glory. And then she asks instead, but what if God is one of us? And at that point, passion fills her words. There's no longer that tacit, yeah, 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 when she's talking about God up there. You know, a God that's distinct from us, a God that's different than us, a God that's up there, you know, in this little bubble of peace and tranquility as we're tearing the world apart down here. All of that gets is, yeah, 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 yeah. But then there's that passionate longing for God who is us. Not a God alone up in the heavens glory, but a God who is a God who knows what it is to, con to face the confusion and the struggle and the hopes of human nature. She's singing about a God who can understand what it is to be us. And there's a special phrase in today's gospel that doesn't really have to be there. But Mark puts it there anyway. 
And that special effect that gets all of the attention is the calming of the storm. Jesus is asleep. They wake him up. Jesus stands up. Be silent. Be still. And nature even listens to God. He listens to Jesus. And the, the people in the boats around Jesus say, who in the world is this? But that overshadows that little unnecessary, necessary phrase. Jesus, says the gospel, gets into the boat just as he was. That is, as a dirty, exhausted carpenter from Capernaum, he got into the boat just as he was. He is the one who Alanis Morissette was singing about when she said, what if God was one of us? That dirty, exhausted carpenter from Nazareth of Capernaum is us. And when Jesus learned what it was to be human, when he got into that boat just as he was, when he knew firsthand how hard it is to be one of us, he threw to the side all of the laws, all of the traditions that would force separation upon people. Instead, read the Bible yourself, and I hope you do. Come tomorrow to Bible class from 7 to 8. It'll be wonderful. Jesus welcomed women in a time when men didn't really associate with women. He loved the Samaritans when Jews and Samaritans did not like each other. He embraced Gentiles when they were the occupiers. He accepted tax collectors as one of his disciples even, and they're the ones who were supporting the occupiers. Jesus, the Son of God, our Savior, he embraced prostitutes. He accepted the disease when people thought that the that disease meant you were punished by God. He accepted the mentally ill. He accepted soldiers. He accepted criminals. And he also accepted everyday folk who were fishermen and housewives. In other words, Jesus accepted everybody. And that's the amazing and the radical and the untraditional tradition that Jesus reveals of God. That's the Jesus of the gospel and the Jesus who was still speaking and the Jesus who got into that boat just as he was. Open and affirming is not only about open and affirming any kind of different sexuality. That's important, but it's not the whole kick and caboodle. It's about Jesus just as he was, who reaches out to us just as we are, however we are, and whoever we are. St. Paul gets a bad rap sometimes because people will quote him out of context, and they even quote stuff that wasn't written by Paul and say it was Paul. But let's listen again to what Marty, the woman who shouldn't even have been speaking up here, said from Paul's text when he comments to an early, wavering, early Christian church in Corinth. Paul says, There is no restriction in our affections. The leaders of the church, there is no restrictions in our affections. And he says to the Corinthians, but only in yours. In return, open wide your heart. That's what the earliest church said to their earliest followers. We have no restrictions in our life. You've got to learn to love better if you want to be a Christian. That's the Christian ideal in which we have to place this whole concept of open and affirming and in which we have to practice it as well. It is thoroughly Christian. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, open wide your heart also. So may Jesus continue to reveal himself to us, and may we continue to listen and to follow his wonderful example. And in this context, today, we celebrate Open and Affirming Sunday. Thank God. In his name we pray. Amen.
get this benediction response in before uh, that, that toll, the bell tolls, because <laughs> I know they're waiting for that bell to toll. Um, so, I do welcome all of you here, and I'm so glad you're with us. I know um, in summer it's a definite choice to come to church on a Sunday. Um, it's not something that you have to do, um, but why would you want to take a vacation from God? I mean, I, I don't understand that. So, um, I do hope that you'll all come back again next Sunday uh, to, to spend this one hour in joy and celebration with Jesus. So let us now uh, conclude our service with our benediction response. As servants of Jesus Christ, we strive to imitate his example. We have been given the ministry of sharing his gospel message of barrier-breaking love. Jesus' grace rests upon each of us so that we can be more like him every day. We seek to be kind and understanding with all people. Our speech will reflect our satisfaction and understanding. We are our hearts. May our ability to see Christ's extravagant welcome help us to tear down the barriers we erect. Let us not be afraid to welcome others. Let us be alive to the possibilities that Jesus calls our attention to, that we are all wonderfully different. In the holiness of God's Spirit, let us go forth from this place to share Jesus' transforming love among all of God's diverse children.